Okay, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our third seminar in this semester uh, for this uh, VSU STEAMH seminar series. Um, before I introduce um, today's speaker, I just want to mention briefly again, um, our previous seminars are available on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube, search uh, Steam H Seminar Series, you will see uh, the recording of both previous seminars over there. And today's seminar will also be recorded and shared over there. And I uh, hope that's okay with everybody. I already got the permission from Dr. Gritek, and I hope that's okay with everybody in the audience as well. All right. Um, now, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today. Um, Dr. Ellen Greentech. Um, first, uh, she received her uh, bachelor degree in biology with highest distinction um, in 2005 from the University of Virginia, which is really close by. I mean, welcome <laughs> back, even though uh, uh, online, not physically, uh, to a place uh, close to where you are murdered. Um, and then she went to Harvard University to pursue her doctoral study. And uh, in 2011, she received her PhD in organismal and evolution biology um, by working with uh, Dr. Marilyn Rubolo and Dr. Dan Hado. And Dan um, Hado, uh, many of you um, probably know, is one of the uh, best known uh, publishing geneticists in the world, right? And through our previous talk, uh, we found out that we actually know quite a few people in common. <laughs> um, and then um, Dr. Gritek did her postdoctoral research at the Institute for uh, Gen Genome Sciences at the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine. And she did the uh, postdoc only for one year over there and then was recruited by the company uh, which she is now working at, uh, Parabon Nanolab uh, in company. Okay. And at the, the company, she started as the lead bioinformatics. And uh, but gradually, almost every year, I see in the, her resume, almost every year promoted to a higher level, right? Uh, then to bioinformatics manager and now director of bioinformatics. Okay. And uh, she has uh, not only um, published um, papers in the field of um, genetic genealogy but also received um, quite a few grants, uh, particularly from DOD and uh, also from National Institute of Health. Right? And uh, she had been a very popular um, speaker, invited uh, to speak at many venues. And uh, she, uh, she also presented uh, many times at conferences. Right? And uh, recently, um, in the last few years, actually since uh, 2015, um, in, she had uh, appeared in many um, uh, TV channels, all right? Including 2015, um, appeared in NBC Nightly News, as well as the, in uh, the Code Justice program at TNT, as well as uh, Fox and the Fox uh, Business channels. And uh, 2018, she also appeared in CN program, uh, Mission Ahead, uh, 48 hours of CBS and uh, Inside uh, Edition at, and also uh, NBC Natural News, uh, just uh, some of them. Um, and also uh, appeared on Discovery Channel, which is one of my favorite channels. So whenever I, I can find any time to watch uh, TV besides PBS, of course. <laughs> Uh, she also appeared in um, ABC's uh, program 2020 uh, and NBC's Dateline. I'm sure many of you are familiar with those um, two programs. And uh, 2019, she appeared in Dateline again and also Voice America for uh, Eastern Europe. And 2020, she uh, um, was featured um, in the ABC's uh, six episode series called The, G the Genetic Detective, all right? Uh, some of you might have watched that program before, right? But she uh, also appeared in the Japanese um, program called Seven Days New Custer. 
And as I mentioned, TBS is my favorite TV channel. So if I ever have any time to watch TV. Um, so uh, she appeared in the NOVA program, uh, which again is uh, one of my favorite programs besides nature on PBS. Uh, so uh, just in this year, 2021, she appeared in the NOVA program called Secrets in Our DNA. Again, um, she is not only a well thought out um, speaker, but also um, she uh, uh, received um, a lot of interviews and appeared uh, in uh, many TV programs that reached a much broader audience, right? And in 2019, actually, she was named uh, as one of the uh, Inverse Future 50 honorees, right? Which was for 50 people who will shape the coming decade. I truly believe so, right? With her work, the wonderful work at the Parabon uh, Nano Lab in company, and which she will talk about today, right? Without further ado, let me give the mic and the screen and the room to Dr. Ritek. Thank you, Dr. Ritek. Thank you for that introduction. All right, I'm going to share my screen and take you all through the work that I do working on cold cases using forensic genomics. So traditional forensic DNA analysis, the sort of thing you see in TV all the time that's been around for decades, um, is called STR profiling. So this uses short tandem repeats and it basically generates a fingerprint from a DNA sample. It's just a set of numbers that can be compared from one sample to another to see if it's the same person. So this is great for establishing identity. You can compare um, a sample found at a crime scene or from unidentified remains to a suspect uh, and tell whether they're the same person. And it's great for that. If, if the person you're looking for is either in a database or one of the suspects you're looking at, but if it's not one of those people, then it can't tell you anything else. All it could tell you is whether the person was biologically male or female. So what we're doing, I think of as like advanced forensic DNA analysis. We're looking at a different type of genetic marker. Instead of that fingerprint, we're looking at what we call a DNA blueprint, which is, are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And the goal here is to analyze the DNA, again, from a crime scene or unidentified remains and try to generate new information, not just is this a person we've already identified, but rather, can we predict what this person looks like, who their family members are, can we try to figure out who they are from the DNA? And then at the end, it, the identity of that person is always established using those traditional forensic methods. So we help the detectives figure out who to look at, whose DNA to test, but in the end, it's always that direct DNA match uh, that's what goes to court and is used for, for arrest and prosecution. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is DNA phenotyping. We call this snapshot. It means predicting someone's appearance from DNA. The first thing we need to do is predict a person's ancestry. So again, this is something that you may think, oh, this has been done all the time. I can go to ancestry.com or 23andMe and they'll tell me about my ancestry and that's true. But that has not been the case in forensics. Forensics has been very focused just on this identity testing. Uh, and so bringing this new type of technology in has been a big deal. So the reason that we can figure out someone's ancestry by looking their, at their DNA is because of the history of human populations. So if we look back in time, 50 to 100,000 years, all of the modern human population was in Africa. That's where we evolved and that's where our species emerged. And it was only later that people began to migrate out of Africa. And so originally back in time, we were all you know, one population in Africa. Some subset of those people then migrated out of Africa, some stayed in Africa, some migrated out. And those gradually over thousands of years migrated across the world into Europe and into Asia, then you know, to Oceania and the Americas. And so, the truth is that we can actually look at DNA and sort of figure out 
which of those populations that person comes from. So this is research from the journal Science from 2008. And what this is showing, each vertical line here is a person. And what they've done is looked at these people's DNA and just asked a mathematical algorithm, a statistical algorithm, divide these thousand people into seven groups uh, just based on their DNA. And what came out, not surprisingly, is that people from the same population have uh, more similar DNA to one another and that those seven groups really did correspond to the seven continents. So we have people from Africa, the Middle East, Europe, Central Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. And you see that a lot of people are not just from one group. So for example, this is a population from Algeria. You know, they're sort of similar to Africans, sort of similar to the Middle East, and sort of similar to Europeans because they're geographically in the middle. And so what that means is, you know, I talked about these seven populations and this out of Africa event, but human variation is continuous. It doesn't just stop at Africa and then pick up somewhere else outside of Africa. As we migrate from one place to another, the genes have changed with time and just a little bit from here to here, from place to place. But at those intermediate regions, you know, everything is continuous. And that's why ancestry is distinct from the concept of race. So the concept of race is that there are discrete categories and that this person is different from that person. That is not the case. That's not what we see in the DNA. We see that the DNA continually varies throughout human populations, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still signals that we can pick up to say, this person's DNA is more similar to people in Africa than it is to Europe, or this person is most likely from Asia as opposed to the Americas. We can still pick that up in the DNA. And so the way we do that is by collecting a lot of people. Um, at this point, I've got, I think I'm almost up to 14,000 people from all around the world. So these are from population genetic studies. They've been collected uh, because their DNA represents the area that they're from. And we can use that information, those genetic references to look at a new person whose DNA, you know, we have the DNA, we don't know anything about them. And we can say, who are they most similar to? What populations most likely make up this person's background? And so in very simple terms, that's what this looks like. Is this person from Europe or are they from Africa or Asia or the Americas? You know, this person just comes out as European. Maybe that doesn't seem very useful, but that's something that detective didn't know before. So we're already starting to give them something they didn't know. And then we can also look within populations. It's not just at a continental scale, but you know, within Europe, we do see genetic differences between people who are Italian versus British. And again, it's, it's a cont continuum between those two regions, but we can still distinguish them. And so this is a person who's primarily Northwest European. And we can also do this for people who have mixed backgrounds. So this is something that is also quite new in forensics. Even the tools that were originally developed for ancestry testing in forensics could really only tell at that global scale, you know, is this person African or European or somewhere, in, if it was somewhere in between, they really couldn't tell. But the type of analysis that we do can tell that. And so this is someone who was sent to us during a, a blind evaluation. So early on, uh, it was very hard to convince detectives to work with us because it sounded so different and so new. And so they would basically send us DNA from people that they knew and ask us to make predictions to prove that it worked. And so this was someone who was sent to us when we analyzed his DNA, it came out as about half East Asian, a quarter Native American, a quarter European. You know, this was not similar to anybody we had in our, in our, um, in our database, but we were still able to figure out that his East Asian ancestry was Japanese, his American ancestry was Central American, and his European ancestry was Southwest European, so Spain and Portugal. So what we really saw was a profile of someone who was half Japanese, and half Latino. So when we see that mixture of Native American and Spanish, you know, that tells us that's likely a Latino background. And so we were able to, you know, in this case, just tell this person's friend that we were able to figure this out about this person just from his DNA. So that's for ancestry. With phenotypes, it's not about the pattern, it's actually about specific variations in the DNA that distinguish people with different traits. 
And so when we look at different people, we know that um, you know, different people have different eye colors and we know that that is genetic because it's passed down through families. And so the question is to find what parts of the DNA determine your eye color. And the way we can do that is using what we call genotype plus phenotype data or G plus P data. It's basically a giant table where we have, in this case, I'm showing 3000 subjects where we have a description of their eye color and we have their genotypes at a million different genetic markers or SNPs. And what we're looking for is SNPs that correlate with the eye color. So this is just a very simplified example, but you know, here at SNP3, we see that the people who have a GG genotype have a blue eye color and the people who have an AA genotype have a brown eye color. So if we were to see uh, at, a, uh, at a crime scene sample that this person has a GG genotype, then we could tell that detective, well, this person is more likely to have blue eyes. And of course, things get more complicated than that. I'm not going to go into this, but in many traits are also influenced by the interaction between SNPs, which can be really difficult. Um, but yeah, that's the idea is we're looking for a statistical association between the genetic markers and the physical trait. And so you can imagine how we can do that for something like eye color, but what about face shape? Face shape is very complex, uh, but we can actually do it in the same way. It's just, we need to figure out a way to quantify the shape of someone's face so that we can say what is different about these faces in order to look for those genetic differences. So what we do is we use a 3D camera or these days, what we've done is we've actually developed an iPhone app where you can hold your phone in front of you, turn your face back and forth, and it will make a 3D model of your face that we can then analyze. And so we've, we're running a study where people can sign up and fill out their phenotypes, scan their faces, and um, turn that into genotype plus phenotype data. If they've uh, been tested with 23andMe or something like that, they can upload that data. So once we've done that, once we've scanned someone's face, we can describe it objectively as just the X, Y, Z coordinates of each little point on their face. So we end up with thousands and thousands of variables that describe each face. And we can turn that into what we call a face space where we're describing, uh, well, this is what we call principal component analysis, where uh, we take a lot of variables that are correlated with one another and turn them into a smaller number of variables. Uh, so my one example I use is, so let's say there are 300 points making up the nose. So we have X, Y, Z coordinates at each one. You know, we've got 900 variables to describe a nose, or we can just say that person has a bigger nose than that person. So that's sort of a, it would be like a principal component is the size of the nose. Uh, and so this is what that actually looks like. Uh, the first face space dimension is really just how feminine or masculine is the person's face? And again, this is just emerging from the data. So this is not saying, you know, women look like this and men look like this, but that's sort of how we can interpret this, that on one end, we have this very narrow, long face, and on the other end, a very round, more feminine face. My face is longer and narrower, so I might be somewhere over here, but we can scan someone's face and put them somewhere on this axis, and similarly, if we have their DNA, we can predict where they would fall on this axis. So as we add more and more variables, more principal components, so this one is sort of the shape of the jaw. Do you have a square jaw and chin or an angular jaw and chin? This is independent, so you can have an angular jaw and a round face or an angular jaw and a long face uh, or with square jaw. And then we can add even more and more detail with each dimension. And the goal is then to predict what an unknown person, where they fall on each of these dimensions and use that to predict the three-dimensional shape of their face. So once we've selected the genetic variables that associate with each trait, we then use machine learning to build a predictive model. We use what we call supervised machine learning. So it's basically you give this algorithm all of your examples. So we've got the 3,000 people with known eye color, will we let it look at what are the variables or the SNPs that associate with blue eyes, and then try to build that into a mathematical model of eye color. And then we want to know how we're doing. 
So just building a predictive model for eye color, that's one thing, but we want to know whether it's actually getting the right answer. So to do that, we need to make predictions on people whose eye colors we know. So if we made a prediction of blue eyes, we need to know whether that was right or not in order to evaluate whether we were accurate. And these subjects need to be new to the model. So if your model was built knowing that subject one, two, three, four had blue eyes, then it's gonna do a really good job at predicting subject one, two, three, four's eyes. What we need to know is what about when we have data from an unknown person at a crime scene who we have no idea what their eye color is, how confident can we be that they will be, that their prediction will be correct? And we might want to make a lot of these predictions. If we just make three and they happen to all be right, then we can't just declare that we are always going to be right. We want to make thousands of these predictions. So the solution to this is what we call cross-validation. So if we go back to our example of eye color with 3,000 people in our data set, we take 10% of them and set them aside and call them the testing set. We're not going to look at them until the end. We're only going to work with the remaining 90%, which is our training set. We use that training set to do our SNP association. So we select the variables that associate with eye color in that training set. We build a predictive model and then use that model to make predictions on the testing set. So this model has never seen those subjects before. So when we calculate how accurate it is, that is similar to what we would be doing in real life in a real case. So we can then compare our predicted values versus our actual values and see how often were we correct? How close did we get it? Can we do a better job predicting blue eyes than green eyes? Those sorts of things. And then we have to do that 10 times. So with each 10% of the data, we take each 10%, set it aside as the testing set, work with the remaining 90%. So we now have to do everything 10 times, but at the end, we have our 3000 subjects. Every single one of them has been predicted on using a model that they were new to. So we call those out of sample predictions. So we now have 3000 examples of how we can do and how well we can predict eye color. So then once we have these models, we've calculated our accuracy, we want to actually make predictions. And again, these are in, in law enforcement cases, you have no idea what that person really looked like. So we need to be confident that we have uh, the right answer and we need to communicate how confident we are in those results. So we use what's called microarray genotyping primarily to generate data from these crime scene samples. So this is a technology that was developed for clinical work where you typically have a living patient who can give you a lot of really nice, fresh, intact DNA but we have forensic samples where we only have a little bit of DNA and it may have been sitting at room temperature for 50 years. That, that does happen. Um, but we found through a lot of testing that the microarray actually works really well. And what it does, it targets specific sites in the genome that are known to vary commonly between people and just measures the two possible alleles. Is this person AA, AB, or BB at each SNP? So this is what that data looks like. It's just, here's the SNP that was targeted. The RSID is an ID assigned by uh, the NIH, where it is in the genome, chromosome and position, and then the genotype. So this person, it was read that they're in AA. If we genotype someone else's data, they might be AG or GG. So we take that data, plug it first into the ancestry model and find out, okay, this person is European, this person is Northern European, then we wanna predict eye color. So when we make a prediction using machine learning, what comes out is just a number. It says this person's eyes are a 1.56, which by itself is not very informative. But what we can do is then look back at those 3000 predictions we made during our cross validation and see, well, when we made a prediction of 1.56, what eye colors did those people really have? And so we do what's called consistency. We test how consistent this new prediction of 1.56 is with the distributions of predictions made on people with each possible eye color. So this is showing um, on the right, the, the range of prediction values for people with blue eyes, 
green eyes, hazel, brown, and black eyes. And we see that this 1.56 is the orange line. It's falling right between blue and green, just at the edge of hazel and very far from dark colored eyes. So what this is telling us is that it's very rare for someone with brown or dark brown eyes to have a prediction this light. And we could put numbers on that. How objectively consistent is our new prediction with each possible eye color? Well, it's basically evenly consistent between blue and green. So we can't be very confident in either of those. So it's only, you know, it's most likely blue eyes, but we only have 50% confidence in that because there's a pretty good chance they could be green. So we wouldn't want a detective to run out and say, okay, you can take everybody with green eyes off the, off of the suspect list and we're only looking for blue eyed people. Uh, but if they had someone with brown eyes on the suspect list, we can tell them, well, there's a 99.3% chance that this DNA did not come from someone with brown eyes. There's still that 0.7% chance, so they don't eliminate those people. But if they're trying to restart an investigation, they're not going to start by talking to the people with brown eyes. So we can then do that for each trait with skin color. This person has very fair skin, most likely blonde hair, maybe on the darker end of blonde and probably some freckles. Then we can make a prediction of their face shape. So we predict an actual three-dimensional shape for their face and then compare that prediction. So this is a prediction that was made using uh, their sex, their ancestry, and thousands of SNP genotypes that are unique to that person. We then compare that to a prediction made just using sex and ancestry. So it's kind of like a baseline. If we knew that this person is a Northern European female, and then we predict Northern European female and this specific set of genetic markers, how are those two faces different? And that's what we can describe. So this is something that was really hard to figure out was how do we communicate what someone's face shape is to a detective? And what we came up with was that we, uh, we make these heat maps where we show how does this person's, uh, this person's face prediction differ from that baseline prediction in the width, height, and depth. And so this person has a particularly narrower jaw, like a, so they have a, a narrower face and a longer face uh, and more protruding mouth. So those are the things that we put together and then we make this three-dimensional face shape that emphasizes those predictions. Finally, we can put it all together. And so all of that comes directly out of the prediction software. At this point, this is where a forensic artist gets involved. So we give him our predicted face shape and these predicted traits. And our artist then says, oh, chooses eyes from a palette that match the prediction, hair, skin, all of that to make this composite. And the reason that this is an artistic uh, thing is that uh, we only have access to the DNA. We don't know anything about this person that's not written in their DNA. So obviously this was from my DNA and this is the prediction that was made. And, you know, it's not my driver's license photo, but if I were on a suspect list, I'd think I'd be pretty much prioritized based on this prediction. But I always say, now imagine I have the exact same DNA, but I'm 70 years old, 700 pounds, shave my head and have a face tattoo. I'm going to look very, very different despite having the same DNA. So it's very important to know that these predictions are predictions just based on DNA. So anything that's not genetic, whether someone wears glasses, how they wear their hair, if they have facial hair, um, all of those things can really affect your appearance and we can't know them. So this, uh, this composite is really intended to be just a description of that person. Uh, and we found that this can be very, very powerful in, in a lot of cases. And one question I get a lot is, don't all the faces kind of look the same? And so this is sort of an issue with how we interpret faces. You know, when we put on this digital skin, it's always very smooth. And so everybody sort of looks young and um, they can look kind of similar, but they really are not. And so an example here, is, this is three different face predictions made on three different people with the same ancestry. So subject one, this is my face prediction. And then two and three are two other Northern European women from my office. And you can see that in the width, so subject two 
has basically the opposite. She has a very wide jaw and mouth, whereas subject three has a very wide chin. So they're very different predictions. And that's true both in every dimension. So if we emphasize those traits, you see that the face shapes look very different from one another. And when we apply the phenotype predictions, we come up with three very different looking composites. And those differences are reflected in the actual appearances of those people. So this is just a little screenshot of a very small part of our website. This page, if you scroll, goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, these are predictions that we've made of people from their DNA. And then the person that they ended up arresting and matching to the DNA to that sample. Uh, or the brown ones, this is an unidentified remains and the woman who was eventually found to have died and left those remains. And you can see just how well we can do with only the DNA. And again, these are not, there's not going to be only one person in the world who matches these predictions, but when combined with other investigative information, this can sometimes be the difference between a, a case that goes cold and one that can be reinvigorated because now they have some new information, some new leads to go on. Uh, another service that we offer is called distant kinship inference. So instead of predicting uh, just phenotype, so what is this person's eye color, we can actually compare DNA between people and determine their degree of relatedness. So again, they, isn't that something that's done all the time? You can get your DNA tested at Ancestry and find all these relatives you didn't know about. And that's true, but you need to be able to spit in a tube and give them a lot of really nice fresh DNA. Whereas we're going to have to do this with, you know, bones that are 50 years old or something like that. And so we build the models in the same way, but instead of looking for single SNPs that associate with eye color, we're looking at the patterns of genetic sharing between DNA samples and trying to say, well, these people are first cousins or second cousins. This can be especially useful for unidentified remains. Often there isn't DNA from the actual person to do a direct comparison. There's only their great niece or something like that. And we need to be able to tell, is this the person who belongs to that family? And so we can do really well. We can predict with very high accuracy out to sixth degree relatives, which are second cousins once removed and distinguish them from unrelated pairs. And this has particularly become useful. We're working with the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory, which is responsible for doing the DNA testing to identify soldiers who, there are still tens of thousands of soldiers from past conflicts, particularly World War II, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, who have not been identified. Their remains have not been returned to their families. And so AFTL has really been pushing the envelope on, on DNA testing for really, really difficult samples like this. I mean, if these are, have been at the bottom of the ocean or some of them were buried or cremated, I mean, there's just a lot of damage that can be done to this DNA. And we've been able to help them uh, actually do this testing and, and tested it on, um, on samples going back to World War II. And the way we do that is instead of using that microarray, we do targeted genome sequencing. Uh, and so in that case, we're not just looking at this specific set of SNPs, but we're looking at um, a lot of different parts of the DNA. Uh, but the problem is even with this new technology, we miss a lot of data. That unidentified person, you know, we're only gonna get a little bit of their DNA and we still need to be able to just tell, is this the person who came from that family? So we're working on a paper now, um, it's currently in preprint that so you can look at on our, on our work with AFTO. So now the topic that people are most excited about, I think is genetic genealogy. So this is really new. This is a whole new area. Uh, that we got into back in 2018 uh, after the Golden State Killer investigation happened. Uh, we were contacted by C.C. Moore, who is a very well-known genetic genealogist, said we should be doing this on lots of cases. So we did not work on the Golden State Killer, but we, since that time, you know, it's only been, it's been less than three years, we've helped close over 150 cold cases using uh, genetic genealogy. 
Um, so we put out a nice paper in 2019. If you want to know a lot of the de scientific details of how genetic genealogy works, there's this paper in Forensic Science International. Uh, but I'll go through it right now. The idea of genetic genealogy is that we're trying to identify an unknown individual using DNA and combining that with traditional genealogy. And I use the term identify because we're trying to figure out what their name is, but still, even with genetic genealogy, it's only a lead. Even if that lead is the person's name and address, it still needs to be confirmed using that traditional forensic DNA analysis that I talked about at the beginning. So the first thing to do is generate DNA from a forensic sample. That's something we knew how to do very well at the time that we started doing genetic genealogy because we had done so many cases with DNA phenotyping. It's the exact same data. It's just analyzed in a different way. So instead of running it through our models to predict uh, their appearance, although we do that also, we take the DNA and upload it to a database of genetic genealogy participants to try to find relatives, distant relatives, and that we know their relatives because they share DNA with our unidentified person. So here's what that looks like. Uh, DNA is inherited from parent to child in this fashion. So this is a simplified example where we have two parents. Uh, parent one has a dark red and a light red chromosome. Parent two has a dark green and a light green. When they have a child, they don't pass down intact versions of their chromosomes. Each of their chromosomes undergoes recombination and they pass on a random combination of their own DNA. So this person, their child, inherits this combination of parent one's DNA and this different combination of parent two's DNA. And the same thing happens if that person then has their own child, they pass on a random combination of their own DNA. And so I keep using the word random. This is a random process. If that same couple then has another child, recombination happens again, but this time in different places. And so that next, that other child inherits a different random combination of their same parent's DNA. And so this is called shared segments. So the uh, first, the sibling one and sibling two, they share this dark green piece of DNA at the top of the chromosome, then a dark red piece, then a light green piece. So those are actual shared pieces of DNA that those two people inherited from their common ancestor, which in this case is their parents. So it's very easy to do with two siblings, but as we get out to cousins, second cousins, those pieces of shared DNA are going to be smaller and smaller. And so what we're trying to do is distinguish these pieces of DNA that were inherited from a, a common ancestor from the rest of the DNA that's not. That's what I just said. Okay, so the way that we do that to trying to find those shared segments. So we know that's what's happening biologically, but now we have to look at the DNA data and say, this piece of DNA was inherited from a common ancestor and this one wasn't. And the way we do that is we look at that SNP microarray data, just like we did uh, for phenotyping, but now we're comparing two samples. So let's say subject one is our unidentified person. So either uh, perpetrated from a crime scene or unidentified remains. And subject two is someone in a genetic genealogy database who has chosen to participate in law enforcement matching and has put their DNA up there for comparison. So we look at this first SNP and we see that subject one is AA, subject two is GG. So they do not share any DNA at that SNP. Therefore, they cannot have inherited any of their DNA from a common ancestor at that site. But then we look at the next one. Subject one is AG, subject two is AA. They both share an A. Well, okay, that's gonna happen a lot just by chance. There are gonna be you know, millions of people who share that A. But then we look at the next site. Subject one is TT, subject two is CT. They both share a T. Okay, now we've got two in a row. Now, if we keep going and we see more than 500 SNPs in a row where they share DNA, and that covers a large range, a large genetic distance, well, that is more likely to have happened by chance, sorry, that is more likely to have happened because that, that genetic segment was inherited from a common ancestor than to have happened by chance. It's very unlikely for that to happen by chance. So that's what we're looking for. And the two databases that we can use are GEDmatch, which is a public genetic genealogy database, and Family Tree DNA, which is a DNA testing company, but also allows people to upload uh, their DNA files to it. 
And in both of those sites, users have a choice whether to opt in or opt out of law enforcement matching. So you can use GEDmatch, you can use Family Tree DNA and say, I do not want law enforcement to be able to uh, compare to my DNA, and that is your choice. Uh, so we're only comparing against people who are opted in. And other DNA databases like Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage are not available to law enforcement, either because they don't allow uploads and or because their terms of, of service prohibit it. So we're limited to these two databases and only to people who are opted in. And when we do this DNA comparison, we never actually see the person's DNA. So this is a comparison of my DNA to a third cousin who I did not know, who I found in GEDmatch. Um, she and I share 71.5 centiborgans of DNA, but this is all we see that she and I share DNA on chromosomes three, six, and 21. Here's how long they are, how many SNPs are in those segments, where they are. That's all we see and that's all we care about. You know, I don't, I know, all we care about is the relationship. This tells me, you know, if I were the unknown person, we know that now, whereas our unknown person before could have been anyone in the world, now it has to be someone who's related to this person in GEDmatch. So we add up the total amount of shared DNA all across the genome, and that correlates with relatedness. So the amount of shared DNA, parent-child, they share all their DNA, first cousins share uh, less DNA, second cousins less, and third cousins less. So this graph is showing um, on the y-axis the amount of shared DNA, and then the distribution for people with different relationships. So what you see is both that more distant relatives, as we go down along this graph, they share less DNA. And also those distributions are more spread because more distant relatives uh, have gone, they're separated by more recombination events. So basically there's more randomness that's going to broaden that, um, that amount of shared DNA. So now we've done that, we've looked in the database and found these distant relatives to our unknown person from there, really the DNA is just serving as a clue. All of the rest of the work is, is legwork with genetic, with genealogy, building family trees. So let's say we found a match in GEDmatch who shared 300 centimorgans of DNA with our unknown person, which would be amazing. We hardly ever, ever find ones that close. But we look at this chart, we see 300 centimorgans falls right, mostly in that yellow distribution of second cousins, but it could also be a fourth degree relative, first cousin once removed, or a second cousin once removed. So there are multiple, and not only that, but if we know they're fifth degree relatives, well, that's not necessarily second cousins. It could be first cousins twice removed, or great, great, great grandparents, etc. So this is all the GEDmatch gives us. There's a relative in there. They share DNA with our unknown person. That's it. All of the rest of this is just a lot of legwork. So building that family tree first back in time and then forward in time. So we're not interested in match number one's great grandparents. We're interested in their second cousins. So we need to then build forward in time. Um, and so, sorry, the building back in time is usually simpler than going forward because you just need to look for people's um, birth certificates, which is, uh, public information in much of the US, but records aren't always available. So if that pa person's parent was born in another country, we might not have access to the records. And just because a relationship is on paper doesn't mean it's necessarily true in biology. Um, the person might be adopted. Uh, they might have a parent that they don't know about, um, or they could be a child of a donor. They don't know who the parents are. So all of those are make things difficult, but Let's say we can build all the family trees back in time. Then this is what I was just talking about, building forward in time to find the other descendants. So this is back in time. Then we build forward, trying to find. So in this case, we have now a list of all the second cousins of match number one. Not all descendants can be identified. So sometimes people are born out of wedlock, not recorded as being the child of a particular person or their records might be in, might be wrong. And sometimes families are just very large. I mean, if you go back to the 1800s in the US, you'll see, and then they had 13 children and then they had 13 children. And you know, over a couple generations, you end up with a lot of possible people. 
And now the goal is to narrow down the possible identities. So we know these possible second cousins of our person. Now we want to know which one we're looking for. So we can use the sex of the person, you know, if it's male, then we can eliminate all the females. The date of the crime, if it was a sexual assault, we know they had to at least be an adult. And the location, I mean, they had to be there, which means they often lived in the area, but sometimes it's, you know, they went to school in the area, they knew people in the area, they were just passing through, we see a lot of truck drivers, that kind of thing. Um, but one of the most useful things we can use is what's called triangulation, triangulation, and I'll take you through that. So let's say we have multiple matches. We look in GEDmatch, we found our one second cousin, and then we find another relative. And now we need to know uh, who is re related to both of those people. So this, is, so this is that family tree from match number one. Now let's say we have a second match. We need to do the exact same thing, building back in time and forward in time, but now those two matches, they don't share DNA with each other. So what that means is that their family trees need to intersect through a marriage or at least a child. So you think back, your two parents aren't related to each other, but they're both related to you. And so you are related to both of their sides of their families, but your mom isn't related to your dad's family and vice versa. So what we're then looking for is a marriage between these families. And if we can find a marriage certificate that has children of the right age in the right place, well, then that tells us now all of a sudden, um, whereas before we had all of these second cousins and all of these second cousins, now the people in green, those are the only people in this family tree who are second cousins to both matches. And that's where the triangulation takes us from hundreds of possibilities down to one. So this is a, let's see, we've got just a little bit of time. I'll take you through one case study. Um, this is a 1987 cold case, uh, been cold for 30 years when we started working on it from Washington state. And so in this case, we found two matches, just like I just described, two matches on dead match who were both at about the second cousin level who were not related to each other. And what the case that we were trying to solve was the homicide of these two young kids who had driven down from Canada to the Seattle area uh, and you know, their bodies were found a few days later. And so we built the family trees of both of those matches and things get complicated. You know, for example, uh, here where it says first husband and second husband, we had a case where uh, one of the children had uh, held the, the name from a different person who was actually, then was actually his father, but we're all able to put it together and point the detectives to this man who had never been on their radar. He was not in a DNA database because he hadn't committed any other felonies, but by comparing his DNA to that crime scene DNA, they were finally able to, you know, after, more than 30 years, connect one single person back to that crime scene. Uh, and he then became the first person to ever be convicted. Uh, so he did not plead guilty. He actually went to court and he was convicted uh, for this crime. And so I won't go through the rest of my um, case studies unless there aren't questions, but if there are questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them at this time. Uh, we have almost 10 minutes left. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gritek, for that wonderful talk. Um, yeah, it's perfect timing. We do have uh, about eight minutes for question and answers. So anyone has a question? So uh, I think for now, you can just unmute yourself and ask question directly. I have a question. Um, sure, go ahead. So earlier, let me just look at my notes real quick. Um, you were working on DNA phenotyping in one segment of DNA. Um, yep. It's just along for the ride. Do you have a way of distinguishing that from the I'm sorry, could you repeat that question, Jesse? Yeah. Um, it's 
some research on my own. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah is there a question specifically about one part of the talk? may have lost him. <laughs> Did he leave? Um, oh, okay. Um, any other question? Oh, okay. Well, while you're thinking, I'll go through this case study because it's pretty interesting. This is another homicide of a young girl in, in Washington. I don't know why Washington was where we started, but the first couple of cases we worked on were from there. Um, so this was a girl who had you know, gone to the park with her siblings and you know they went home to get lunch and when they came back she was gone and they found her body um, that night and so in this case we were able to use the phenotyping predictions along with the genetic genealogy so we predicted that this person had about 10 percent native american ancestry in addition to primarily being northern european and again we had two matches in GEDmatch who didn't share dna so we we're looking for that triangulation and in doing this research, Cece found these cousins of match number one who seemed, you know, they lived in the right place and they had, both, they had Native American, two Native American great-great-grandmothers, which would make them one-eighth Native American. But when she built their family trees, they were supposed to be um, one degree more closely related than would be predicted given the amount of DNA. And also they had no connection on paper to match number two. So we couldn't do that triangulation. But in building their family trees, she noted a unusual coincidence where back in, I think 1930, um, these two people, match number one's relative and match number two's relative lived in the same very small town in the year before uh, one of their children was born. And so she hypothesized that while on paper, uh, this person's father was one person, it was actually this relative of match number two. And that would combine those two trees. And so she presented this hypothesis to the agency they, and they investigated and were able to match uh, that DNA again, back to, uh, back to that crime scene where help able to help solve that crime after more than 30 years. Now, more questions? <laughs> yeah, time to think about them. Yeah, any more question? Um, a lot of the other people are thinking about questions. So uh, I have a couple and then. Uh, first, so for your um, genetic genealogy study now with uh, like some of the company like Jamesh and uh, Family Tree DNA. Um, I mean, first I want to ask you, so um, have there a lot more people who opt out? Uh, um, so uh, at Family Tree, people are by default opted in and only a very small proportion of people have actively opted out. Mm -hmm. um, on GEDmatch, people were opted out and need to opt back in. So there's been a much smaller proportion opted in uh, at GEDmatch than at Family Tree DNA. But uh, the evidence seems to be that there are some people, but not a lot who explicitly do not want to participate in law enforcement matching and who opt out, but it's, it's not a lot. Okay. So does that affect your work uh, a lot? I mean, yeah, GEDmatch opt-out day was a, a rough day for us. Uh, they hadn't warned us and all of a sudden, all of our cases had zero matches because they opted out everybody. But it's been steadily coming back. They now have, I think, close to 300,000 people opted in. Uh, it's just now a lot of our cases we have to upload to both Family Tree and GEDmatch, whereas before we only needed GEDmatch. Mm -hmm. Well, my other question about uh, the first part of your talk, uh, genotype to phenotype uh, research. So uh, for the steps that you look at, um, were they all in the coding region or um, some of them are also in the regulatory region or even in the endogenic region? Yeah, um, a lot of them are regulatory. And as you know, the I mean, the microarray chips, most of the SNPs are not in the exome, they're just 
you know, scattered throughout the DNA. So we're really just looking for a statistical association. We don't then do the fine mapping to find, you know, the causative functional SNP. All we care about is, is there enough signal to make a prediction? Um, so, you know, a lot of those SNPs really are not, they're not changing the protein, but they are affecting the regulation in some way, or they're linked to something that is changing the protein. Okay, thank you. So, Hopefully there are some other questions now. <laughs> so I know, uh, I mean, this genetic analysis could be uh, complicated. Um, so, uh, but uh, again, it, it shows its power now, right? With the genetic genealogy study, as well as the you know, uh, genotype to phenotype um, research with machine learning. Yeah, it's been amazing how many unsolved cases there are out there that just need some new lead. They just need something. And, you know, that's all it takes, some new piece of information, because these cases are cold for a reason. You know, if they haven't been able to solve it for 40 years, you know, it's because there just isn't enough information already. And so sometimes it's just that one new lead, and that's all it takes. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, go ahead. I, was, I don't have a question, but um, like with the information that you uh, had gave us, I want to say like what you like all of that is like very very interesting, and like you 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 gave me a new light on all of it to be honest. So it's like I really appreciate you for like explaining it how you did. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot to me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is relevant to many people. Um, I mean, even if you're not studying. Um, dynamics are not working in the field of uh, uh, comparative dynamics or evolution dynamics and uh, this genealogy is relevant for many people. So um, thank you for uh, the comment. All right. Yeah. If, any other question or comment? If no more here, we're right at one o'clock. So it's perfect timing. Great. All right. Thank you very much again, Dr. Britek, for your wonderful talk. And uh, you probably can only hear me <laughs> typing. <laughs> uh, but Thank again, you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I always enjoy talking to students. Uh, yes, I, I, I hopefully a lot of students will benefit from this talk. Right? Great. And again, this uh, our recording will be available on YouTube. Hopefully uh, many more will enjoy it, right? Okay, and with that, but last one last thing, um, give me just one second about uh, next Friday's good, good, good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Again, I hope I will, uh, next Friday, we'll have uh, Jennifer Dona from uh, University of uh, California at Berkeley, uh, who was uh, also uh, one of the Nobel laureate last year and uh, she will talk with us about the revolutionary uh, CRISPR technology next Friday, right? I hope all of you there. Other than that, have a great weekend. I'll Thank see you, you a week from now. Bye, everybody. And thank you again, Alan. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.